Well, welcome back to the program. Joining me in the uh, studio so tonight, Roger Montgomery from rogermontgomery.com, where Ken is interested in Atlas Iron. How are you going, Ken? Yeah, that's good. Thanks, Dave. I just wanted mainly directed to um, Roger and what his value of it is going forward in the next couple of years. But I'll be interested in what uh, everyone thinks about it. All right, sure. Okay, what do you think, Roger? Uh, G'day, Ken. Nice to uh, nice to hear from you. Um, uh, I have owned Atlas Iron for a little while uh, and I've been reluctant to talk about it simply because it is a commodity uh, business and I'm not very good at forecasting commodity prices. Uh, having said that, this business uh, is a, uh, what I would describe as an A3 business, so it's very high uh, on the quality scale. Um, it's not an A1 or an A2 and it's trading at about a 19% or 20% discount to its intrinsic value. Now that intrinsic value is going to be largely determined in the future by what happens to the iron ore price. And I think this, I think uh, a very important change occurred uh, to um, Chinese policy uh, on January 3 this year. Uh, while I was away on holidays I read something that really took my interest. Uh, previously if you're an exporter in China uh, of any product uh, you had to repatriate any money you earned overseas, you had to repatriate that money, bring that money back to China, give it to the People's Bank of China and, and they gave you renminbi. Uh, the result was the Chinese government obviously ends up with foreign reserves which they don't want because it's inflationary. So on January the 3rd what they decided to do is uh, for approved companies, so you have to just basically tell them you're doing it, any earnings you have overseas you can leave them overseas and you can invest them overseas. Now I think that's a fundamental shift to Chinese policy that will have dramatic impacts uh, on the values of business or the prices of businesses uh, because I think what will happen is as money is accumulated overseas uh, and it's invested overseas it'll be invested in the sorts of businesses that produce the things that China needs. Now the most, I guess the biggest by dollar value Chinese import last year was oil, it was about 160 billion US dollars and the second largest import was iron ore. Iron ore was about 60 or 70 billion US dollars. So it seems obvious to me or it seems likely to me that if there's going to be mergers and acquisitions activity uh, in Australia it's going to be around the businesses that produce the things that China needs. Atlas Iron Ore already has some Chinese on its register um, uh, and it's a, a great quality business and it's trading at a discount to intrinsic value. Um, but again the caution is uh, that uh, that intrinsic value is determined by the commodity price and I really don't know where they operate is I look for great businesses first. Yeah. So they have to be a great quality business and they have to be cheap. Mm. Um, if they've got bright prospects so there's a great story around mm. then that's fantastic. All the better. But that's not the first thing I look for. I'm not a thematic investor as such. Mm. I'm looking for great quality businesses when they're cheap mm. but I'm also looking for businesses with bright prospects. Mm -hmm. So if I can find a reason why its prospects look bright well that just gives me some comfort around mm -hmm. the valuations mm -hmm. and if it's at a big discount well uh, maybe I'll be a bit more aggressive in purchasing those shares. I think there are better businesses yeah. there's no doubt about that uh, and I've spoken about them for a long long time now yeah. um, but it's also important that we we don't invest through the rearview mirror it's important that we look to the future mm. for these businesses mm. uh, and if new management comes on board uh, Oriton for example using taking your argument well you would never have bought Oriton when Sally Sally McDonald joined the company because looking back at the numbers it was, no a, it was a dog's breakfast. No, yeah. um, the Lane family were running it. Wouldn't have uh, intrinsic it. value. You're right. And yet, you know, intrinsic value has risen threefold yeah. yeah. uh, since. I was, um, just wanted to know about uh, coal stock, Universal Coal, UNV. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, just a general overview. I know it's going to be a bit hard for a technical because it only just got listed. Mm. Um, but if there's any fundamental. In Perth. And John Breville has caught your eye. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, Roger and um, you guys what you thought about Breville and, and Roger, how's the second book going? <laughs> See, I, I think John's being nice here saying, uh, Roger and I, yeah, you, you, you guys too, what do you think? <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm going to go straight to the start, what do you reckon? Um, uh, it's, uh, it's expensive compared to its intrinsic value, I've got intrinsic value now of um, $2.95 Having said that though, uh, next year, based on 2012 forecasts, its performance and quality, um, it's actually been improving dramatically. Mm. So the 2010 results were very good results. Mm. Its balance sheet was very good. Um, it's the best it's looked since 2004. Mm. Um, mm. So it was a basket case there for you know, global financial crisis. 2007 was pretty mm. bad, 2005 was pretty bad. Mm. Um, but this 2010 result was a very good result.
intrinsic value rises to $3.30, but as you can see, that's where it's trading right now. Um, so it does seem to me that uh, the intrinsic value of this company is going up, and in fact, it's been doing a great job of going up. It's gone up phenomenally since the global financial crisis. Not in price, it, it's done that as well, uh, but in terms of its intrinsic value, it's risen significantly. Uh, that looks like it's going to continue to occur over the next couple of years, but perhaps not at the same rate. Uh, and it looks like the price um, is, is a little bit optimistic right now. On the line, TRS is the stock of interest you own. Uh, yes, it is. I just wanted to say uh, I love the book, Roger. It's great. Um, I know it's had a big dip recently, the reject shop, and I bought I thought it. you were talking about my book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure that's something That's well. not a chart of my um, book. <laughs> uh, I, it had a recent dip uh, recently because of, um, you know, weakness in the earnings, and um, I bought it around the mid-$13 range, and then subsequently it's dipped again. I just wanted to get your thoughts on um, if you think it's still a good company in your eyes thanks in terms in terms of quality uh, yes it is it is still a very high quality business there's no doubt about that but one of the things that I've talked about recently and I've written about this um, uh, for Alan Kohler and I've written about it uh, elsewhere on my blog um, I sold my shares in the reject shop at about $15 uh, prior to the the rise up to about $19 which you can see there on your screens um, and I did that for one reason and that was that I could see that return on equity was beginning to flatten um, now there were some fund managers who disagreed with me uh, they said that I was being premature uh, and they were right I sold it at $15 or $16 and it rallied to $19 but it's now well below $15 uh, and and I'm not I'm not saying that that means that I'm a genius or anything like that but in Australia we have 22 million people retail businesses uh, they make a lot of money uh, because they can retain their profits uh, and they can employ them at very high rates if they've got a good model. Uh, but eventually they run out of the good sites uh, and, they get, and, and once they've run out of good sites, they end up with second best sites. Uh, and those sites tend not to, uh, not to produce the same sorts of returns as the earlier ones. And also as they spread their tentacles across Australia, they have to have much better um, delivery systems. Now, the reject shop, unlike, for example, uh, JB Hi-Fi, the reject shop actually has its own distribution centres uh, from which it actually takes all of the product that it imports and then it distributes it to the stores. The, re the um, JB Hi-Fi doesn't have that. JB Hi-Fi actually relies on its supply for that uh, and so it's a, it's a slightly different model but both businesses at some point in a population of 22 million people are going to mature they're going to mature much faster than a similar business in the United States because it's got 14 times the population uh, and I could see that that's what's happening this is a great quality business but it's not going to grow at the rate that it has in the past Australia's business channel